Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Family Academy. My name is Felicia Hyland, and I am the coordinator of equity and engagement for the school division. Our topic tonight is pandemic parenting, supporting our kids. This pandemic has had an impact on everyone, but the impact on our children is of a, is of a, is a special concern. We are excited to be able to share information and strategies to help families support their children. We are hosting tonight's Academy in collaboration with Greater Trauma Informed Community Network and the Virginia PTA. I want to thank Rebecca Van Root and our presenter, presenter <laughs> Jenna White, for their partnership. A little about our presenter. Jenna is active in the movement to create trauma-sensitive schools, and she is passionate about empowering parents to understand childhood trauma and how it impacts our communities. As an active member of the Virginia PTA, she serves as the Health and Safety Chair, the representative for Fairfax's Trauma-Informed Community Network, and VP of Outreach at Glasgow Middle School. Jenna has presented throughout Virginia and at national conferences. Welcome, Jenna, and thank you for sharing your expertise with WJCC families. Thank you, Felicia, and welcome everyone. So glad that you could join us um, either tonight live or maybe later on the video recording. And uh, I just want to mention right off the bat, I did send a PDF of this presentation and a couple of handouts to Felicia. So she'll be sending that out and making those available to you as well. Um, I am going to ask uh, for some feedback at times in your chat box. So if you can uh, keep that open or if you're on your phone. I know mine always goes to sleep right when it's time to, um, to do something, but please stay close to your chat box. Um, and certainly as you have questions, uh, you can put them in either the chat box or um, the question panel and we'll be monitoring those and trying to save some time at the end um, to, to get to some questions. So let's get started. As Felicia said, um, here's a few of my titles, but my most important title, of course, is as a parent. I have two boys, uh, one 13, who's in middle school, eighth grade, one uh, in college. They're both here right now. And then I'm also doing um, some childcare for um, some friends, families. So I also have a second grader here during the week doing virtual learning. I have a fifth grader here during the week. Some days I also have a fourth grader here during the week, also all boys. So some days I have five boys with a wide range of ages and temperaments, um, all doing virtual learning while I'm trying to work from home. So I certainly can um, sympathize, empathize, relate to uh, what we're all going through as parents. I'm not a clinician, um, but as Felicia said, I've become very involved with this work, um, in particular the trauma-informed work because my youngest son uh, did experience quite a bit of trauma um, in his early childhood. And at that time, I really didn't have an understanding of what that was or how it was impacting him. And so we ended up with a lot of other diagnoses. He was in special ed, he had an IEP, and it wasn't until he was about eight when I learned about early childhood trauma that I understood that was what we were seeing uh, being manifested in a lot of his issues. And so once I learned that, I was just full steam ahead in terms of um, really trying to understand it and then how to help him, how to help his teachers. And it's really just grown from there because I know that many other families are in that, that same situation uh, where they're struggling for answers and, and struggling for help. So that's really what led me um, to do this. I do love um, learning about parenting. All the tabs on my computer are different parenting articles and blogs and things like that. Um, and I enjoy talking to parents. And so I hope that you will find this um, helpful tonight. I'll give you some resources uh, for things you can follow up on on your own as well. And then as I mentioned, um, some handouts in this material. So um, just to kind of get us started, and while some people might still be coming in, if you could go ahead in the chat box and just give me an indication of how things are going for your family on a scale of one to 10. So zero being not so good, 
10 being um, really doing quite well during this pandemic in terms of especially your children, um, pandemic learning, virtual learning, hybrid learning, whatever your case may be, um, and kind of how you might feel about um, you know, their future or how worried you are. So scale of one to 10, um, not too worried or not too bad uh, at, at, as a 10. And then, I'm sorry, um, zero is not doing well, very concerned, 10 doing well, not so concerned. Um, so if you can start putting those in the chat and we'll just kind of see um, to get a range of kind of where everybody's at and just give us an opportunity to just kind of settle into this moment and, and think about, reflect on how we're doing. And I like this um, graphic in particular because I think it reminds us, you know, how normal it is to really go through a wide range of emotions. Um, and that's not just from day to day, but it could be within a day. So from, you know, minute to minute or hour to hour, we might be feeling drained one minute. And then maybe a few hours later, uh, we're feeling hopeful. And then maybe by, you know, bedtime, we're back to losing our, our sanity. We might fall asleep with a little bit of gratitude. Um, on our mind. So that's exhausting to go through that roller coaster. But again, it's very normal and it's certainly to be expected. So we need to really um, remember that. So we're seeing um, a lot of people actually in that mid range, getting a lot of fives, some a little higher, some a little lower. Um, but it looks like there's a lot of us that are sort of in that same um, same boat. So that's, that's interesting. I, I really get kind of different range um, every time I, I do this presentation. So again, hopefully this information will um, be helpful, maybe give you some reassurance and help you maybe bump that number up a little bit with some hopeful messages and some practical tools. And just um, also kind of prefacing before we get into the uh, presentation, it's just kind of thinking um, as we reflect and think about what's going on in our homes and what we can or can't do is that concept of self-compassion, especially for ourselves as parents. Um, I know that's something that I can struggle with, but it's just such an important reminder to really have that uh, compassion and understanding for ourselves and try to practice that regularly. So here's a few tips and some things that can help us uh, really have hopefully the right mindset of how to, how to think about what we're all going through. So the first section, we're gonna kind of look at the landscape of what's going on. You know, obviously we all know what the challenges are. We're all in the thick of it we're down in the trenches um, this graphic i've been using for quite a while it's actually from last spring um, and i just to me i think it really encapsulates the situation this woman is a, a therapist and the only spot she could find in her house to create her virtual office to do counseling with her patients was in the bathroom so she commandeered this bathroom she tried to make it as nice as possible she's got the plant on the toilet seat she's got another plant in her comfortable chair and she's just you know trying to deal with it as, as best she can and, and the headline you know dispatch from a mom in quarantine from the bathroom floor and some days i feel like you know that that pretty much um, says it all of what we're dealing with and, and where we're all at and then here i'm not going to take a lot of time with these but if you want to go back and and look at them you know again some days we laugh some days we cry one minute we're laughing one minute we're crying um, but i've grabbed a couple of these as i go i really like the one um, talking about when you're working from home and you're trying to do virtual learning from home you know and you're getting that work done maybe five ten minutes 20 minutes at a time throughout the day I thought that was really uh, reflective of what we're all going through. So on a more serious note, you know, the question is, what is happening to our kids? Um, a lot of times I'll use the title, are the kids okay? Because I've seen that um, many times in the media, right? Are the kids okay? Will the kids be okay? Here you can see the title, the kids aren't all right. Um, and so, you know, when we see these headlines, it's really quite overwhelming. It's really quite discouraging. Um, and I think we have to be really careful when we see these things. Um, hopefully, if it's a really well-written article, it's gonna be very comprehensive and just not just throw out sort of that fear factor, but it's gonna address some of those things that we can do and give a more comprehensive picture, you know, of that landscape. 
um, because otherwise, you know, it's, it's really um, hard not to give in to some of those sort of scare tactics. So I think we're really trying to find the balance as parents and as a community, you know, as a, as a school community, as a, a local community, wherever we live, um, of, of what is the right, you know, where to land? How do we have the appropriate amount of concern and the realistic amount of concern? Because there are very valid issues, obviously. But at the same time, how do we not get stuck in that, right? How do we know how to address it? And how can we still have that hope and that ability to move on? So um, if you're interested in reading any of these, the links are here that you'll have in the PDF if you want to go back. But again, I was just trying to kind of... Um, capture the landscape. And with that too, it's important to note, you know, if you see a lot of those headlines, either on um, media or social media, and it's starting to really affect your mood or your mindset, it's really important to try to take a break from it and, and step back. So no more news for a while, maybe just detox or take a break um, from media. I saw a clip of an NBC story that was really quite provocative. I mean, it was just kids crying and screaming on the floor and I just thought it was a little too sensational and not really that um, responsible and not really that helpful. So just try to um, evaluate what you're looking at and see if it's really um, helpful to you or not. So again, that question, uh, will the kids be okay? And the answer that we're going to discuss is really it depends. And so there's a couple things to keep in mind when looking at, you know, a complex issue like that, like this. And the first is, um, that certainly for kids and for any of us, it's really important to consider where we were at when we entered into this crisis. And especially from that trauma-informed perspective, we know that as many as one in four children have experienced some sort of early childhood or chronic trauma. And so the numbers tell us um, that there are a lot of kids who came into this pandemic already with that um, experiences that they've been carrying around. So I know in our school district, for example, our superintendent, he's always talking about, we're all experiencing trauma. We're all experiencing trauma. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I wish he would really stop saying that because the way he's lumping everyone together with that sort of blanket statement, um, I don't think is particularly helpful. It's really not a very um, nuanced look at it. I know he, what he's trying to communicate, but again, it's really important that we um, sort of take a step back and think about where we were at when we came into this crisis, not put all kids and all families um, sort of into that same boat, right? And then the second um, point here is that regardless of where we entered into this global pandemic, what we're gonna talk about tonight and what we need to keep remembering is that there's a tremendous amount we can do to change that trajectory. So to the, the, the thought of, um, you know, will the kids be okay? It's, it's yes, if, if we do these things. Yes, if we make these kinds of decisions, if we commit to do the work. It's, it's not um, just the automatic, right? Yes or no, we can't just give up um, or hand over sort of their fate, right? We have, to inter we have to get involved and intervene. And then the third point is just being mindful, especially starting this presentation last spring, with everything happening um, in the world and in our country with Black Lives Matter, you know, this is the time when you add that layer plus the pandemic, when we really have the opportunity to reimagine our society. When we're more, hopefully more aware of these issues, more aware of how to respond, and then hopefully more energized, more mobilized on how to respond. And the idea that we don't want it to go back to the way it was before. So again, uh, the answer before, you know, talking about it depends. So how do we get to yes? How do we get to yes, the kids will be okay. Yes, uh, we can ensure that they will recover from something like a global pandemic. Yes, they may be struggling in school. Yes, this is really difficult. Yes, it's affecting them. But is it going to um, be a generational, you know, loss? There was one headline or one part of an article where it said that a whole generation is at risk of being lost. And I thought, well, no, not, not on our watch, right? Not, we're not gonna let that happen. So the way to think about that, these are some of the things that we need to um, think about doing. So 
yes, the kids will be okay if we understand how adversity affects the developing brain, and we'll touch on that. If we recognize that kids have entered into this crisis with vastly different backgrounds, and that will impact how they emerge, which I've touched on already. And then we have this opportunity um, to use a tremendous amount of science and data uh, to apply to this situation to mitigate the impact of COVID. And that's really what the trauma-informed movement has been doing prior to COVID. And now it's really, you know, kind of becoming more um, mainstream or, or commonly known, or it's an opportunity for people to uh, find out more about this science, look at the data in light of COVID and really um, energize and motivate people. So wanted to just sort of take a moment um, to look at that terminology and look at language. As I said, you hear the word trauma kind of in particular being thrown around a lot. Uh, my concern is that we're gonna kind of jump from that um, lack of awareness right over to it being so commonly used that we miss that part in the middle where we really have like a robust understanding, where we have a common language, where we have common knowledge that we can act upon. So I wanted to just kind of quickly uh, run through some of these different terms we might be hearing about COVID or the pandemic and just kind of establish that common vernacular. So uh, cr the word crisis, right? The definition of crisis is a stressful time in an individual's life. They're experiencing a breakdown or disruption in usual or normal activities or functioning. So when you think about COVID, how does that relate to this idea of a crisis? Well, it definitely applies, right? It's a stressful time. We've definitely had a breakdown in our normal functioning. We've definitely had a disruption in our normal functioning, both as individuals and as families. And then how does that compare um, or contrast with looking at stress? So when we think about stress, there's a couple of really important things to understand. So there's different types of stress. Stress can be positive. We're all designed to be able to respond to stress and we're designed that we need some amount of stress or it's a positive thing for us. Our bodies respond in a way that help us. Uh, we get our adrenaline up. Our body responds in a certain way. It's designed to respond to stress to help us do our best. So a little bit of stress um, is, is a good thing. When you start getting into higher levels of stress, it's um, what they have here as called tolerable. But the thing to, that I really wanna highlight for you is this part here where it says buffered by supportive relationships. So that is really the, the key part that's introduced here that we're gonna keep going back to over and over again. So now you have, you're moving from positive stress to tolerable. Again, it's, the stress is a little more serious, uh, maybe more frequent, it may be a little bit more intensive but it's still manageable or tolerable because you have supportive relationships that are helping you uh, weather that stress level. When you get to the level of toxic stress, that's when you need to become really, we need to become concerned because now that again, that key part is the last phrase, the absence of protective relationships. So again, it's the level of stress may be higher, the intensity may be higher, but the key aspect of it is that absence of protective relationships. And you'll often hear toxic stress and trauma used interchangeably. Um, and I think that's, that's fine. Um, and especially for our purposes tonight, that's, that's okay. So long as we understand that toxic stress, again, is in the absence of those protective relationships. And then let's look at uh, trauma itself. So trauma, we can remember it um, in terms of the three E's. So the first E is an event, but it's really important to understand that it doesn't have to just be a one-time event. It could be a series of events or even a set of circumstances. Um, and so that was particularly with my son, I thought, well, trauma is just more of a one-time thing. And so I thought, well, that doesn't really necessarily apply to us. I didn't know about chronic or complex trauma which is ongoing or multiple types of trauma that you see here on the chart. Then the second E is really important and that's how the individual experiences it. Because of course we don't all experience things the same way. If we were all on a bus right now and the bus crashed, we would all be experiencing something potentially uh, very difficult, very horrible, 
but our individual experience of it is going to be very different. Maybe for some of us, we'd never been in a car accident before. Maybe for someone else, they'd already been in a very severe car accident. And so obviously that would have a much greater effect on them because they're experiencing it different. So we always want to keep in mind, again, that every person experiences things in a different way. Of course, we have our own personalities. We have our own genetic makeup. We have our own um, life experiences, our own family systems. All of those things go into how we experience, experience something. And then the third E is what we also um, don't always think about or talk about, and that's the effect. So again, a lot of times when I hear trauma, it's being used almost interchangeably for you know, something really bad happened. And yes, that, that's, that may be the case, but when we talk about trauma with what we say capital T trauma, we're really talking about that traumatic uh, response that traumatic effect. So for many of us, again, the notion of something bad happened, um, it might take us you know, months to recover, but over time we can recover from that event and from that experience, especially with support and help. It's when um, the, the person is not able to recover, not able to respond to that trauma, that that effect now becomes manifested and something much more severe and something that's, that's long-term. And with that, you can think about um, an understanding of trauma that it lives in the body. There's a, a famous book called The Body Keeps the Score. And I've heard a phrase, um, also our issues are in our tissues. And so again, that's where that, it's that long-term effect where the trauma doesn't live anymore in our conscious memory it becomes lodged in our body. It's in our nervous system. It's in our, um, our cells. It's in our synapses. It's in our connective tissue. And that's where we start seeing all of those really long-term um, effects. So again, we want to think about and remember that trauma can get man manifested and really stuck in our body. And oftentimes the nature of trauma is such that it's unknown, right? Or it's unseen, it's unheard, it's unacknowledged. So you can think about a case of say, for example, uh, child abuse. The child is literally being told this did not happen, right? They're, they're being denied, but they're told that what they know they experienced didn't happen. So there's no way for them to process it or to get help or be in a, in a protective relationship because uh, it's not allowed to be acknowledged. When you think about something like racial trauma, right? It's very difficult to heal from that. It's very difficult to process it because as a, as a society, we're told uh, that we don't have racism here. So again, it, it's the ability to metabolize or process the trauma that's really uh, key. And we'll, we'll come back to that. And then in terms of sort of the rest of the brain science, this is what could be, you know, an entire presentation and a many day presentation. Um, but I think this is where it's really exciting because we have such a more uh, robust understanding of the brain than we have, um, of course, in, in decades past. And the way now that we can apply this knowledge to something um, like parenting and day to day, our day to day interactions with our children. So I'm going to try to hopefully give you just enough information so that um, the tools and the techniques we're going to talk about will uh, make sense within this context. So the first um, idea is that our, the image of our brain here and our brains develop from the bottom up. So of course, when we're born, we um, are just working on our basic instincts. And so you see here, that's the lower parts of our brain, which we can call the reptilian brain. As we grow and through experiences and through interactions with other, our experiences of the world, we start developing, um, our, our brain starts to grow, the sheer size, the mass, and then the parts of the brain, the, brain, the architecture continues to grow and expand. So that middle part of the brain um, is, is more of our emotional center, and we call that the mammalian brain, where it's a little bit more evolved. And then the last part of our brain to develop, all of that you see in orange is what we're probably all familiar with is our prefrontal cortex. So that's really the thinking part of our brain, the analytical part of our brain. And that doesn't really fully form. Now they're saying the late 20s, it used to be when you're a teenager. Then they said when you're in your around 21, now I think they're saying it's not till you're 26 or 27. So, you know, as parents, we have a ways to go until 
our kids' um, thinking part of their brain is fully formed and fully function. But that really has an impact on um, our behavior and our responses. And so we'll talk about that as we go. And then the little graphic, the cartoon there, you know, the, the concept of fight, flight, or freeze that we may have heard of, that's really connected to that lower part of the brain. The other thing to think about is how that's connected um, to our nervous system and how that fight or flight response is automatic. It's an autonomic response. And so as we get into to, um, looking at responding to behaviors, it's really helpful for parents to um, have that mindset of understanding that fight or flight, fight or freeze responses are not um, intentional. They're not willful by the child. They are again, automatic. And then moving over to the right, uh, that phrase, the neurons that fire together, wire together. Again, that's um, referencing how our brains are built. So not so much the architecture side, but the circuitry. So if you think of our brains as being an elaborate system of um, electrical system of circuits, again, that's based on our experiences. So when we're born, we have less neural connections and um, that picture uh, looks very much like the roots of a tree, right? All those squiggly lines, and then they start becoming uh, denser and denser and more and more interconnected based on our experiences. But with that is the knowledge that um, experiences also become hardwired. So as a child, if your experiences is that of safety, trust, relationships, your brain is going to be wired in that environment. If your environment is that of uh, neglect or chaos, unpredictability or abuse, your brain is shaped from those experiences right down to the way that it is wired. And then the last graphics are just really to kind of give that, give us that visual idea as we go of our nervous system. I like the graphic that shows um, how it's really connected all the way from our brain. We tend to think of, you know, a separation here, our, our head versus our heart, when this, we know that it's all connected, right? It doesn't stop here and then somehow pick up again down here. Our, our brain, our head is connected throughout every part of our body. Um, and there you can see through our, the spinal cord, there you can see an individual um, neuron in the neuron endings. And then with that is the um, description again of how stress affects our body. So trauma gets into our bodies, stress gets into our body without us thinking about it. It can give us um, a headache, a stomach ache, all of these sorts of things can have a physiological effect on us and they can be um, traced back to stress. And again, um, thinking about our, our different levels of stress, when we start getting up to toxic levels, that can really start to have a, a cumulative effect on our physical health as well. So we're gonna kind of touch back on some of these concepts, but again, this is just sort of a really quick um, overview of the landscape of kind of that, that brain science. And then um, with that, some of you may have seen this before or heard of it. I don't wanna take the time to show the video because we don't have a ton of time, um, but I would encourage you to go back and watch it. It's only about five minutes long. Um, and this is Dr. Dan Siegel, who's done the hand model of the brain. And so he talks about um, that connection between the different parts of our brain and the idea of when we um, flip our lid, the way our brain works is that we're not getting to those thinking parts of our brain. And so that's true of children, but it's true of all of us, adults, parents, we certainly flip our lids. And so this is something that can help us for ourselves. It can help us as we relate to our children and in parenting. And it's even something that we can teach to our children. Many schools use this. Um, there's something you can even talk about with your children. Say, I feel like I'm flipping my lid, or you look like you're, you uh, may have flipped your lid. So again, I just encourage you to go back and learn a little bit more about it because we don't have, have the time right now. And then just to kind of summarize, you know, in terms of um, our brains, and, and I like this because it talks about what the brain cannot take and then what the brain craves. And this kind of helps us understand the environment that the brain really wants and likes. And then those things that happen that make it really difficult for the brain. So of course, we're gonna um, look at some of these things in more detail. You know, the things that the brain craves, it's easy to see then of course, how those would be very healing. 
um, especially in response to stress and trauma. So I like the way this dichotomy here is laid out. So the good news, as I've been referencing, is that trauma can be healed. It has to be intentional, though. It's not automatic. Um, that's really my kind of have an issue with the phrase resilience or resiliency, because that's the other thing you hear thrown around. Well, children are resilient. Well, children don't just pop out of bed in the middle of a global pandemic and be resilient, right? Resiliency or resilience needs to be more of a verb that we actively um, create in our children or that we activate in them um, as a society. So again, stress can be mitigated. We do have the research that shows us how to do this. And then this is also known as we uh, talked about before, protect, we talked about protective relationships. Protective factors are things that have been studied that are known um, to affect our ability to move on, to heal, to process. And then the last thing with that, while we're kind of talking about brain science, is the idea of neuroplasticity. And again, this goes along with the good news. So even though I touched briefly on how the brain is shaped by experiences, how it's wired based on our experiences, our brain also is so amazing because it has the ability to reform itself. So new synapses can be formed. Synapses can be strengthened. We can uh, generate new neurons in our brain through positive experiences. So even a child who has experienced a lot of adversity prior to the pandemic, who has really experienced some of the worst of the pandemic, we know that this isn't just conceptual. This isn't just you know a parenting tip. We know from brain science that we can intentionally create experiences that will help their brain uh, recover. And again, this is something that, that as parents and as educators can even be taught to children. And, and I love that graphic on the right where we talk about um, kind of strengthening or, or working out those parts of the brain. So now we're gonna get into what the specific things are that, that we can do um, to help. So I keep trying to kind of simplify this. Um, so I've come up with the top three things that I wanna talk about that we can all do as parents. The first is the power of relationships. That word has come up many times. So we're gonna talk about that some more. Uh, creating safety and then changing your mindset about behavior. So let's get into those. First one is the power of relationships. And really um, we know through science and through decades and decades of research um, that the number one protective factor, and again, this has been studied. This isn't my opinion. This isn't someone else's opinion. This is uh, absolutely proven that a positive relationship is the biggest mitigating factor in any stress, any trauma, any crisis. So it's that idea of you are the safe harbor in a storm um, that in, you can even just begin and that's something you can always you know go back to that that bond and that relationship we have with our children even if it's strained or even if it's um, might be a little bit um, severed through the stress that we're all experiencing there's always that opportunity to to go back and start building on that relationship so i'm not sure if this video is going to work let me move it over here it's very brief and i'm gonna talk over it because it's just music in the background. So I never thought I'd show a TikTok video in a presentation, uh, but this is something going around called the cuddle challenge. So you can see um, parents were instructed to cuddle their toddler while they're watching their favorite TV show. And so you can see this dad, the daughter was just sort of doing her own thing. He comes up, he crawls into her lap. She's sort of like, wait, what's happening? Oh, dad's here. And then it starts to sort of sink in like, oh, he's, he's sticking around. Now she starts to respond even more, right? She starts absolutely lighting up. And I feel like, you know, again, going back to some of that brain, that's really the, the main part I wanted to show because I feel like it just um, has that tremendous visual of um, demonstrating. I feel like you can just see her brain absolutely lighting up those synapses firing, right? Those neural connections, that wiring in that wonderful positive way, it's all just firing. You can just see it in her face and in her body language. And what a tremendous effect that interaction and that moment between the dad 
and his daughter just had. Okay, so let, there we go. Whoops. So with that, um, and this is one of the handouts that you have here, this uh, number, this tip sheet, COVID parenting. And I know it's a little hard to see here, but this is put out by several groups. So this is the number one parenting tip during COVID-19 from the following groups, World Health Organization, UNICEF, USAID, CDC, and then several others. So their top tip and to, to respond to COVID for parents is just really this simple, one-on-one -on -one time with your child. And so it, it breaks it down into, into different, um, different aspects of um, information. So several things to keep in mind with this one-on-one -on -one time. One is that um, this is not time where you're disciplining your child. It's not time where you're correcting them or lecturing them. You're spending time with them. The child is directing the activity. The child gets to choose what to do. You follow the child's lead and you give them your undivided attention. So it's not while you're in the car and you're saying, well, we're having a conversation. Uh, it's not while you're trying to, you know, keep an eye on dinner on the stove or something. Um, it's, it's what they want to do. And so people say, well, what if they want to watch TV or what if they want to play video games? That's okay. You watch them play the video games. Maybe you ask them questions about it, but you can decide what um, that looks like. So maybe it's only 10 minutes. This doesn't have to be hours and hours. It can be a very short period of time, but done in that way. So again, um, it's not about any sort of feedback to them or discipline for them. It's simply just reveling in their presence, um, allowing them to sort of bask in the glow like that little girl did with her dad. Um, again, it doesn't have, it's not quality, it's not quantity, it's the quality. And so even if it's once a week, for 10 minutes and it's the consistency. So, you know, if you have multiple children and of course you're so pressed for time, trying to figure out how to make this work, it can be very small chunks of time, but done in that way. And scientifically, this is gonna strengthen that relationship to the point where you're gonna help them heal and protect them from any potential negative long-term effects of something like COVID-19. I know, um, at, when I first started trying to do this, at that point, there were a lot of challenging behaviors, and so I found it very hard to do. I had to start off with two minutes at a time because in order to, you know, I wasn't able to go more than that without having to discipline because the behaviors were so challenging. So I know that that sometimes can, can be the case as well. And this can be um, teenagers. It can be college-age kids. You know, at, at first, they might balk at it but secretly they will like it, whether it's, it's going for a walk or again, whether it's even just watching them play video games, whatever they want to do in short periods of time. And then if it's going well, you start expanding on it. It's the uh, repetition that's important and, and that structure. And then I really like this graphic, the idea of um, us being the North Star and that idea of how we are that guidepost for our children and just how extremely important that can be, how extremely therapeutic we are just in our relationship and just by nature of being the child's parent or their guardian or their caregiver. It has a tremendous ability. Here it says promote resilience, restore their sense of safety. So uh, I try to hold on to that image of being the North Star, especially those times when it's really difficult. And then along with that, again, under relationship, is co-regulation. I really like this graphic. So when their storm comes charging at us, if we can meet it with calm, we'll be able to really help them co-regulate. So co-regulation is defined as warm and responsive interactions that provide support, coaching, and modeling that children need to modulate their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So that modulation is really the key part there. So here's just, oh, and then, sorry. Uh, why this works. So again, just kind of pulling up the brain uh, model so we can go back and reference it. So when we are connected with our child, that signals this reptilian part of the brain, all is well, right? There's no threat here. You don't need to go into fight, fight, or freeze. You can, you can calm down. You can relax. That part of our brain is always scanning our environment every second of the day. And so that part of the brain says, hey, we're fine. I can, I can cool off. Everything's good here. 
uh, let's move on to the higher parts of our brain. So that self-preservation signal is sent out. Then it starts getting into that middle part of the brain. Now we're in the social emotional hub. It starts releasing positive hormones. And remember that image that shows it's all con that connectedness of our whole body. Those cortisol, those positive um, chemicals like cortisol, uh, oxytocin start getting released, right? Throughout our whole body. And so then we start experiencing that good chemistry starts flowing. And then it starts even going up to the upper parts of our brain, those parts start lighting up. And we can, we've even seen this in CAT scans and PET scans, which parts of the brain are activated in different situations. So I love that idea of it's, it starts lighting up, right? So now they're connected again to that rational, that thinking, that logical parts of the brain that help them uh, can stay regulated, make good decisions, access motivation, all of those sorts of things. So the bottom line is when they feel safe and connected, and those two things really do go together, safety goes with connection, a child can focus on learning new skills and good judgment. So this is just sort of a, a summary of this section on relationships. Um, consistency is really important. Extreme empathy is really important, especially when we're dealing with a crisis. So normally you might not be as inclined to be, you know, really empathetic about something. I know it, it's hard sometimes. I'm thinking, you know, th this is really not something you should be upset about or uh, you need to be doing something else and trying to really respond with, wow, you know, this is really hard. I can see how um, how this is really upsetting. I, I would feel the same way. Just really trying to overdo it even, just really pour it on. And the thing um, that's really sort of a mantra in trauma-informed care that I, I really think is such a good takeaway, a really easy way to remember it is this graphic here, connect before you correct. So those times when we do need to redirect or discipline, we can always just stop and think, how can we connect with this child first? So maybe uh, you want them to, you know, maybe they're playing with Legos and it's time to go to school. Just take 30 seconds, get down on the floor. Hey, what are you building? Oh, that looks really interesting, but it's time to put them away now um, and go to school. Instead of just walking in and saying, put the Legos away, it's time to go to school. If we can stop, make eye contact, uh, exchange a few words with them, maybe exchange some sort of physical connection, a hug, a hand on the shoulder, then start directing them, it does actually make a huge, huge difference. It helps kids feel seen, it helps them feel um, heard, and again, it signals to them um, that all is safe and that they can stay calm and in that good thinking part of their brain. So the, the second one is um, creating a sense of safety, and I really like um, some of the, the ideas here. So structure is really important for safety, rhythm, uh, balance, routine, and when we, you may have heard a lot about routines, 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 and you know, that can be really hard when we're all stressed out. So I like to think of it in terms of um, rhythms, in terms of a set routine. So it doesn't have to be something that's, you know, wedded to the clock. It doesn't have to be, we eat at this time, and then we do this at this time, and then we do that at, at a certain time. It's just that we have a predictable flow of events that is to be expected for the child. Um, it can be somewhat loose. It doesn't have to be rigid, but it's very predictable. And then that they know what the limits are. And again, that they are uh, predictable, delivered with empathy really helps. And then anything involving rhythm. Again, we talked about uh, trauma being in the body. And so a lot of times we need to process it with body responses. That's why things like mindfulness, mindfulness and breathing and yoga are so effective. So you think, well, how can yoga help, you know, address something really horrible, or really tragic? Well, it gets into all those nooks and crannies of our body where the trauma lives. It starts breaking it down and starts metabolizing it. So for kids, you know, things that involve um, rhythm and movement, it could be helping them learn their timetable by playing a beat. Uh, my son was craving rhythm so much that we played a metronome for him. And that was very soothing to him. And that, that rhythm was really helpful to his body system. And so here again, just to kind of summarize tips for safety. And again, with safety, you want to think about not just physical safety, but emotional safety. 
So if, if you're quarantining in your home, you may think, well, we're safe, you know, we're not going out or we're wearing masks or we're following all of these things. So, you know, we're safe, but it might not feel safe to the child. So what does their emotional safety feel like? Because that, that how they perceive it is very different from their physical safety. So we always wanna approach them for how it feels to them and does it feel safe, not just does it look safe to us as adults. And then the last section here is um, understanding about behavior and really changing our mindset to understand that behavior is communication. So there's all kinds of graphics like this, that iceberg concept. So what we see above the surface, that iceberg is the behavior. And many times that could be difficult or challenging behaviors that the child is exhibiting, right? And so we wanna think about what, what might be below the surface. And this gives a lot of ideas. Um, and you know, when our kids are really little, we always think about, well, are they hungry or are they tired? Or do they have a wet diaper? Or do they need this or do they need that? As they get older and they become more independent, I think we kind of lose that mindset. We don't think so much about what might be going on underneath or what might set them up for ideal circumstances. So even though they no longer need um, that same amount of you know, feeding or diapering, or all of those things, we still need to be really aware of, of what's behind it. Is it anxiety over school? Is it fears about COVID? Is it loneliness from being cut off from their friends? And just having that curious mindset and just saying to yourself, I wonder if this is affecting them, or I wonder how um, XYZ is impacting the behaviors that I see on the surface. And when we approach them that way, again, it helps them lower that um, their threat detection. It helps them feel a little safer. It helps them feel more calm and be able to uh, not go into fight or flight mode. So again, there's sort of a mantra that goes with that. If you think about my child is having a hard time, not giving me a hard time, it can really help as a parent to depersonalize some of the things that they're, they're doing or they may be doing to you or to the other children or to your partner. Um, but if you can remind yourself they're having a hard time, they're not trying to give me a hard time. So if you could think about what's the need behind the behavior and then respond to the need, not the behavior. And it takes time, but it can help get out of that sort of whack-a-mole uh, scenario where you're just constantly trying to control and correct behaviors and get to something that's a lot more sustainable and much more positive for everyone. And then the last section here, I just have some resources that again, you will have. One thing I really wanted to touch on because I found this so incredibly helpful with my son. Um, you can call these social stories, you can call them all kinds of things. Um, but again, if, and if you have someone who likes to let you read to them, there's so many wonderful books out there that are so reassuring and calming to the child. And then it's so therapeutic because again, it's done in the relationship and it doesn't even have to be you. It could be an older sibling. It could be anyone. It could be um, the, the student who comes here during the day. He loves watching people read books online. Um, you know, and, and the content again is so tremendous in so many books. And so you can ask um, your school counselor, you can ask parent resource center, you can ask your library, you know, what do you have for social emotional learning? What do you have about emotions? Um, and, and things that are for every age, even for teenagers and older kids, you can ask them for books on certain topics and very, very helpful and very therapeutic. Um, I know you have your own um, library, um, but you can certainly go to other communities as well. I'm here in Fairfax County. We have all, also have all kinds of videos um, here in Fairfax County, especially if you want to get into more specific things, uh, whether it's you know, homework or studying or sleep or eating. Here's one, uh, Rachel Bailey. I really like a lot of her things. So you'll have this link if you have the time and the inclination to go back and watch additional um, information. Oh, sorry, that was specific to Fairfax County. I meant to take that one out. And then these are a lot of um, organizations that I really recommend. And so all of these are linked in your PDF. And what's great about them is many have um, short video series. So you could go in and just watch a three to five minute video. They have great social media um, presence. So you could just go in and start picking up things that way without having to sit down and read a really long book. Most of them have podcasts 
or they have like one pagers. Um, so I highly recommend all of these. Hand in hand parenting is one of my favorites. They really also focus on um, spending that one-on-one -on -one time. They call it special time. So they have a lot of information about that as well. And then Child Mind Institute is a great resource for any, um, a lot of general parenting things, but also any specific topic. So if you have concerns that your child may have an eating disorder or they may be showing anxiety, you can go in and find literally a catalog from A to Z of different um, conditions and experiences and learn more about those as well. Um, and so someone's asking, the PDF is gonna be sent out to you um, by Felicia. And then the other thing I did wanna mention too, um, if you do have concerns about your child, um, definitely, you know, this is the time to really be proactive, right? We are in the middle of a global crisis. If you're seeing um, sudden changes in behavior or things like sleep, or appetite or eating or um, their social interactions, if it's sudden or very extreme and if it's very, really pervasive, right? So again, ups and downs are very normal, but if you're seeing now we're, what, eight months into this, if you've seen a sustained um, change that is really serious, then reach out to um, either your pediatrician or someone on your school mental health team um, and start having a conversation for them if your child needs to be evaluated or just, again, some additional resources. So just sort of in closing, uh, you know, the main theme tonight is that, you know, COVID is obviously a very, very difficult situation. And we can think about trauma similar to how we think about COVID. So we have our exposure levels to trauma or to, to stress, but we also have our mitigation factors. So really it's, it's not one or the other, right? It's the interplay and the balance. And we can't just look at one side of the equation. We have to look at both parts and we have to be uh, vigilant at assessing what our exposure is, but we also have to be really vigilant and proactive about the mitigation factors or the treatment for that exposure levels. So we all have different exposure levels, uh, but we all have the ability to do uh, mitigation or healing. And the, the more we can do of that, the more effective we will be. So at this point, um, I also included here my contact information. Uh, the TICN email is um, a way you can reach out to me. And then I have started an organization called Promise to Address Childhood Trauma. It's just kind of getting going, but I'd love if you, uh, especially on social media, it's a great way to come together. And especially here in Virginia, I'm really trying to collect sort of advocates so that we can all really push for things like mental health, trauma-informed schools, and all of those sorts of things. Um, so at this point, if we have any questions, we have a couple minutes left, I would be um, happy to answer any questions. Or as I said, uh, feel free to follow, me up, follow up with me uh, per individually as well. So Felicia, I'll Thanks. hand it to you for any questions. Thank you, Jenna, this has been great. We do have a few moments if anyone would like to put a question in the chat, but I didn't see any come in. Um, just saying that it's been wonderful and thank you. So with that, I think we will end. You have Jenna's contact information, so feel free to reach out to her or to me and I can make sure that I connect you with her. Um, I will send the information the, that you shared with us tonight to the individuals who attended tonight and try to see if I can post it. This video will be posted on our YouTube channel for the division. So I'll see if I can post any information there as well. So with that, I'm going to say good night. Thank you so much.